In this episode, I interview Professor Max Feely about hip replacement surgery. I'm Dr. Gil Busby, and this is I Forgot to Ask the Doctor. Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to my podcast. In this episode, I'm going to interview Professor Max Feely about hip replacement surgery. Max is a consultant orthopedic surgeon who specializes in surgery of the hip. He has a particular interest in hip preserving surgery and innovative hip replacements. He has also pioneered the use of robotics in hip replacement surgery. Max, welcome. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation onto the show. Thank you very much, Gail. It's a delight to be here. So Max, I find it really interesting to find out why accomplished colleagues like yourself chose their particular area of medicine. So can you tell us why did you choose orthopedics and why did you choose to focus on the hip in particular? Well, it's a bit of an odd story. Um, obviously, I live in Manchester now, but I grew up in Dublin. And when I was 16, I managed to get run over by a car for the second time. Uh, oh. So I managed to shatter my arm bone, my lower leg bone, and a couple of other injuries. And so yes. spent a whole month in hospital uh, recuperating. So during that month, I was under the care of orthopedics. And essentially, I just loved it. Um, I think prior to that, I'd always loved Lego and Meccano. Uh, and then seeing these people walk around doing ward rounds, talking about operating, um, putting big hunks of metal into people, uh, and fixing people was, was really attractive. So that's when it kind of cemented wanting to do medicine. And then when I was a medical student in Trinity, which is one of the universities in Dublin, um, you know, I do different attachments. So I do medicine and surgery and other things. And I just couldn't stand the medical ward rounds, which went on for hours and hours. Whereas the <laughs> orthopedic ones, they flew around, they made quick decisions, and then they got out of there. So I think that just naturally uh, appeals to my character. Now, I would, I would qualify that by saying that I am actually very uh, careful with my patients now, and I do spend lots of time with them. Uh, but, that, but that's what attracted me initially. Right, that was the attraction, right. Okay. So, Max, as you know, this podcast is aimed at educating patients. And as a result, we try to avoid using medical terminology as much as possible so that it remains as accessible as possible to everyone. Okay. So, let's start with the basics. Why is hip replacement surgery necessary? What are the predisposing factors? And follow on for that question is, can that risk be reduced in individuals? So, so hip, hip replacements is, well, first of all, it's a really successful operation. Um, and essentially what it involves is um, replacing the joint surfaces of the hip joint. So the hip is obviously the joint at the top of your thigh bone in your groin, uh, and it's a ball in a socket joint. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, that can get worn out. Um, so the most common cause is arthritis, uh, and that's often because of the initial shape of the hip, which isn't quite spherical, so it catches when it moves around. Um, or you can have rarer things like um, conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or other forms of arthritis, or even accidents or trauma where the shape of the hip gets damaged. But whatever the cause of the initial injury, what happens is you lose the, the nice smooth joint surface of the hip and eventually it starts to grind away and wear away and then you're left with bare bone surfaces rubbing up against each other and when it's at its worst it can be really painful so for example a patient i saw today is pain all day pain at night time not able to sleep um, not able to exercise and do all the things they want to do okay so so thanks for that so i, I always ask about risk factors because in certain conditions, sometimes there are things that you can do. There are lifestyle things you can do that can reduce your risk of acquiring one or other condition. Um, is there an increased risk, for example, so many conditions are genetically linked. Is there any genetic link? Because I'm sure people would be interested in that. If their mom or dad has had a hip replacement, are they more likely to have one? Um, is it um, an age thing? Is that a, a, a link? Um, or perhaps body shape, exercise? Are there any things that people can look to to say, well, yes, I can modify this in my lifestyle, which may decrease my risk? Uh, 
So, so that's a really good question. Um, arthritis probably does run in families, um, but whether it's purely a genetic thing or the fact that, for example, if your parents were active and sporty, it's likely that you will be as well because that's how they bring you up. Um, but you can certainly get some childhood conditions, for example, like very shallow hips, which is very common in women. It's called hip dysplasia, uh, and that can run in families. So that can be a genetic component. Um, being active does increase your risk. So particularly doing impact type sports. So okay. football, rugby, that kind of thing. Um, being overweight increases the forces through the hip. So if you have a bit of a dodgy hip to start with, it will probably okay. become more painful. Um, you can certainly do things to help your symptoms. So keeping the weight down, keeping your core and your hip muscles strong. So we would always recommend things like Pilates or core focused yoga. Um, if you're starting to get hip issues, then a lot of people will move away from impact exercise. So they'll probably do less road running and do more cycling and swimming. And that's why there's such an explosion of, of middle-aged men, for instance, taking up cycling because it's very hip friendly. Um, some people try supplements, but the evidence around that is a bit variable. Um, and then obviously you can take painkillers and things to help alleviate your symptoms. But the one thing I don't think is a good idea is to stop being active. Yes. Um, because obviously being active with a dodgy hip can be painful, but the overall health benefits of doing exercise and being active, I think outweighs that. So that would be a push towards getting treatment rather yeah. than stopping all the things you normally do. Yes, that makes sense. Absolutely. And you mentioned today that you had a patient who had pain all during the day, pain at night, etc. Um, is this the main symptom that patients present with or are there any other symptoms that um, patients can look out for? Well, the classical symptom is pain in the groin. So almost in your underpant crease. Um, and it starts off being worse with activity. So, for example, um, you may not get any pain at rest initially, but if you go for a long walk or you go for a run, it can be sore. Um, as the wear and tear gets worse, it tends to become a bit more constant and you might start to get some night pain uh, and then you might start to get some increasing stiffness. And then it's a gradual kind of deterioration to becoming just an activity to more constant and there all the time and maybe needing analgesia or painkillers. Okay, so if I have a similar pain and I'm finding that I'm having to take painkillers kind of more and more frequently, maybe it's interrupting my sleep, etc. And I go along to my GP to um, have a look at it. Is it likely that I would be referred directly for hip replacement surgery? Or are there other things? What investigations? What can I expect? Are there investigations that are done? Um, and what other options may be offered? before um, surgery? Yeah, so so that's very variable actually. Um, and it's kind of on a background of issues around the NHS and being able to provide services. So mm -hmm. a lot of GPs will initially start you on simple painkillers and anti-inflammatories. Um, there may be, they'll give you advice around activity modification, so reducing your exercise. Um, they We'll talk about losing weight. And these are all very helpful things. Uh, the only caveat to that is patients can end up waiting a very long time before they see a specialist. Um, and yes. there may be a role for hip preserving surgery if the damage is very early. And by waiting a long time, you then miss the boat for that and you're, you're condemned to a hip replacement. Um, so I think certainly if we if we saw a patient, we would we would certainly like them to have a course of physio to try and do some strengthening and maybe yes. try and ease up on things which are aggravating it. But if you're not better after two or three months, then I think it's really reasonable to see a specialist uh, and have a bit more investigations and see is there any other options that you could try. Okay. And so for argument's sake, I go along, I go to see a specialist, someone like yourself, and you um, say, yes, well, I think that you're a good candidate and, um, for hip replacement surgery. What can I expect from that? What does the operation entail? What, what do you do? Well, at, at its very basic level, it's about replacing the joint. Um, 
and then there's some extra things on top of that. But if we start with the basics, so essentially most patients will uh, obviously they get worked up for surgery, but on the day they'll come in on the morning, like a lot of modern surgery now. Um, they'll go down to theatre. Um, they nearly all have spinal anaesthetics, so that's where they get um, a needle in the spine, and that numbs mm -hmm. you from the waist down and with some extra sedation on top. And we do that because it's a much safer way of having surgery than having a general anaesthetic, and it reduces the risk of things like blood clots, chest yeah. infection, water infection. Um, mm -hmm. The surgery itself doesn't take that long. It probably takes a, somewhere between an hour to an hour and a half, depending on how you do it. Um, but they're probably down there for about two and a half hours. And then most patients now are only in hospital for two or three days. Uh, as soon as they're fit and they're up and about and they've done the stairs, we get them home. And then the recovery is actually quite quick. So the first three, four weeks are kind of hard work because they often have some swelling and bruising and it's just a bit sore. But by about six weeks, they're normally off their crutches, off their painkillers, working, walking a few miles a day. And then by the end of three months, they're about 90% recovered. So they're almost there. But nearly all patients will carry on improving up to about a year afterwards. And I think that last nine months is more about your fitness level, your core strength. You know, for those patients who've waited a long time, they're often really badly deconditioned uh, and they've lost a lot of muscle strength. So that's why it can take up to a year to fully recover. But it does depend on how bad you are. So we'll see a range of patients from really badly affected, you know, limping, using a stick, to people who just can't exercise anymore. And obviously, if you get them slightly earlier, then they recover quicker. Okay. So so a question I, I often ask is, um, is the timeline, I think you've answered that actually, is the time frame important from suspecting you need whatever intervention to going along to seek medical attention for it. And clearly it is important because the longer you, you leave it, the more your hip deteriorates and the greater the operate, the, the larger the operation you might need. Is that correct? Yeah. So there's a couple of elements to that question. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly if it's left a long time, uh, you can start to get bone loss around the hip replacement and that can make the surgery much harder and therefore mm -hmm. your recovery harder. But that's not so common, actually. Um, the biggest issue is that the longer you're suffering from it, the, the more deconditioned you are, the weaker you get, the less fit you get, and therefore the longer the recovery takes. Um, traditionally with orthopedics, and, and this will still be the case for some surgeons, they, they really want you pretty knackered before you have your operation. So they want you on lots of painkillers, not sleeping at night, maybe using a stick, really poorly functioning. Whereas mm -hmm. I tend to do a lot of younger patients and, and the way I approach it is that once their function level starts to dip and they've tried physio, then I think that's the time to do a hip replacement because it's a very successful procedure. And if you can get them just as they're tailing off, then they quickly recover and they're back exercising and playing sport because ideally that's what you want them to do because that will keep them overall healthy. So just to, um, just to, Bring you back to the actual operation so you you literally replace the joint so the hip is a ball and socket joint and the socket is in the pelvis and the ball is in the upper leg the femur um, do you remove the bone and replace it with a metal prosthesis is that what yeah. you do so so i'm a bit odd because i do a lot of robotic hip replacements uh, yeah. which are a little bit more complicated but if you just look at hip replacements on their own, so essentially you have a relatively small cut at the back of your hip. Um, yeah. And we just work our way through the layers and through the muscle that's there and kind of move them as, uh, aside rather than cut them. And then you, you basically pop the hip out, chop off the ball because that's worn out and you can't yes. preserve it. That yes. goes in the bin. Um, yes. And then if you imagine the socket is like a cup with kind of dodgy cartilage on it. So you yes. pour that out with what's called a reamer, which is like a rough surface tool. Uh -huh. uh, and then that gets rid of all the nasty cartilage. And then you put right. a new cup in. Um, and depending on how you do it, we tend to use what's called uncemented. But essentially the bone grows into the cup. I see. And then down the thigh bone where you've cut off the ball, you put a stem. And obviously, you work out what's the right size to use. Yes. Uh, and then on top of that stem goes a ball. So essentially, the bits that move together are a ball inside a socket 
and you can use various um, materials in that in order to give the patients the best possible outcome and the longest survivorship of their new hip. But we would hope that if you do it right, which is why there's this big move nowadays towards robotic surgery, you would hope that it will last somewhere between 20 to 30 years, assuming they don't get a complication or anything. Okay, thank you. That was a, a really, really clear explanation. I feel like I, I could visualize every step in my head when you were describing that. So it's clear. It wasn't clear in my mind before, but now I get it. I know exactly what you do. And tell us a bit more about robotic surgery. I know you're very enthusiastic, very passionate and, and, and a pioneer trailblazer with robotic hip replacements. How does it differ? Are there any material differences? Um, why is it? I'm assuming, you know, you love it because it is beneficial. Yeah. So, so we know that hip replacements, hip replacement surgery is really successful. And it's probably one of the great successes of the last 50 years. And okay. roughly depending on who's doing it, say somewhere like 95 plus percent of patients do really well. But, and we know that the implants are really good. So they're manufactured well and they will stand the test of time. But if you put it in wrong, they will fail early. So you, so some of the complications around a hip replacement are things like changing the length of the leg, so like perhaps shortening it or making it longer than it should be, uh, putting the cup in the wrong position so the patient has a higher risk of dislocation or it might wear out early. So I think, first of all, you, you have, as a surgeon, which is really difficult, you have to accept that you don't always do a perfect job every case. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And this is what's led to things like robotics. So essentially what happens is you have a CT scan before, we use that to plan the operation. So what size cup do they need? What size stem do they need? Where do you put it? How can we recreate their normal anatomy? And then you use a robot um, to make sure that you put the bits in, in the place that you had planned. So while it sounds um, very fancy, and it is, actually it's just a very, details tool to one plan the surgery properly and make sure you put it in correctly so for example the robot that we use is called a mako there's about 12 1300 of these globally um, and even in the uk there's about 45 or 50 of them now so it is becoming more and more common and um, there's a few in the nhs and i think over the next 10, 20 years, they will become more and more common in the way that it has in things like car manufacturing and lots of other industries. It's essentially about getting rid of human error and giving the patients the best possible chance. Okay, thank you. So um, in terms of agreeing to have any operation, um, of course, we weigh the benefits with the risks against the risks. And hip replacement surgery, although it can be life-changing, um, I guess isn't necessarily life-saving. So um, what are the risks of surgery that you counsel your patients about that you think are important in order to weigh up the um, whether they're ready, whether they want to proceed with this, or whether actually I think I'll hang on with my pain? So I think, first of all, the benefits are that they will be cured of their pain, which is essentially overnight. Um, and once they're over the operation, they can lead a completely full and active lifestyle with no restriction at all. So we have patients who mountain climb, play tennis, squash, run, football, all of those activities. So it essentially allows them to restart their life again. As I said before, the overall success rate is probably around 95, 97%. And what I mean by success is complete resolution of pain which is amazing when you think about it. Wow. But, yeah. but like all operations, and particularly decent-sized operations, there are risks. So the most common ones are the ones we, we talk about are deep infection, which is infection in the actual hip replacement itself. Now, that's probably less than 1%, depending on where you have it done. However, if it does get infected, it almost always means more surgery to try and get rid of the infection. Um, there's a risk of blood clots. Um, which are more common, but we do give drugs to try and reduce that risk. Um, there is a risk of dislocation, which is popping the hip out, and particularly in the first three months. And in men, it's about 1%, and in women, it's about 2%, so 1 in 50. And that's because women tend to be more flexible than men. Men tend to be quite stiff. In older patients, and what I mean by older, we're talking about 70 plus, there's a risk of cracking the bone doing the surgery, but it is low, 
Um, but that's one of the reasons why in older patients we use what's called cemented implants. So we're not driving a metal wedge into the bone. Uh, we use cement almost like a grout, and it reduces that risk. Um, there's a risk of having to redo it, um, but if it's put in correctly, which, for example, is the whole point of robotics, you would expect it to last somewhere between 20 and 30 years. And that's of being a healthy, active person. Um, it gets The risks do increase as you get older. So if, say, you're in your 80s and you've got some heart disease or lung disease, then your risks do go up. So there are risks of things like heart attacks and strokes. But like everything, you've got to balance those risks against the risks of doing nothing. So becoming yeah. less active, putting on weight, increasing heart disease, increased risk of diabetes. So there's no point having a beautiful, shiny hip, which is pristine, if the rest of you just falls apart because you're so inactive. Um, and don't forget, it's not just the physical health, it's your <coughs> mental health as well. So it's being able to exercise, being able to do stuff with your friends, go walking, all that kind of stuff. So so the way to think about a hip replacement is not just for pain relief, but it's about increasing your function and optimizing your function, hopefully for the rest of your life. Okay. So, so you said that a new hip, you'd expect it to last about 20 to 30 years. Are there any factors that influence this? Is there any way you can prolong that? Um, are there any do's and don'ts to preserve your new hip? So the first thing is putting it in right. So making sure that the consultant puts it exactly where it's meant to be. So that that's probably the most important factor. I think um, from a patient point of view, um, obviously you don't want to get things like an infection in the hip and you don't want to break the bone around the hip which patients do sometimes do. But from a general <clears throat> lifestyle point of view, we're doing this operation to allow people to be active. Um, so what I wouldn't want is for a patient to worry about the implant all the time. I want them to be exercising regularly, doing stuff, living their life. Um, and even with that, you'd expect it to last a good length of time. So what I say to patients is really from three months, there's no restriction at all and do what you want. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Um, and well, you, you've, you've answered my last question, which is should the operation, so for example, an example is, for example, prolapse surgery in gynecology. Um, prolapse surgery has a fairly reasonable recurrence rate of the prolapse after surgery. So often we kind of encourage women, you know, not to have the surgery right away, do other things, pelvic floor physiotherapy, et cetera, et cetera, to delay the operation until they really need it to reduce the number of times they may need a, a redo in their lifetime. Um, and I'm guessing this is not analogous to hip replacement. Um, you know, you shouldn't necessarily delay it for as long as possible so that your hip lasts you um, for as long as possible. I'm guessing from what well, you well, said. Well, actually, that's, that's a good point, actually. Um, and traditionally, um, patients were told to leave it as long as they could. Because I think yeah. when hip replacements first started, they would last maybe 10 or 15 years. Uh, yeah. So, for example, I saw a 40-odd-year-old teacher today who had a horrible hip and was in horrendous pain. Um, and some consultants would still say, oh, come back to me when you're 50 or 60 and I'll do your hip replacement. But I think with the newer materials and the better ways of putting them in, like robotics, for example, um, it's reasonable to say, look, they're going to last 20, 30 years. If you're 40 and you've got young children, it's in a really important time of your working life. It's when you make yeah. your most money, when you start you know, saving up for retirement, paying off the mortgage. So these patients need to be active over the next 10 or 20 years and enjoy that time with their family and get secure. So... I think part of my job is to talk them through that and explain the issues. But every patient I see says, look, I need to be able to function now. Um, we'll reduce the risks as much as we can. And if it fails within my lifetime, then I can have a revision later on. And revision surgery isn't easy, but if it's done by people who do a lot of it, it probably has about a 90% success rate. Uh, well, and again, will last a good 10 or 20 years after that. So chances are they will you know, be able to be active for the rest of their life. But I think what you, what I wouldn't do is put somebody off for 10 years of agony and lack of, of function uh, because of some age thing. You, you've got to treat the patient rather than the age. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well said. Okay, so thank you for those really clear and detailed answers to my questions. 
As you know, I always ask listeners beforehand to submit questions that they'd like me to ask on their behalf. Are you happy for me to ask you a few questions? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. As long as there are no disgruntled patients of mine, I'm absolutely fine. <laughs> they didn't mention it outright. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'll get so my I'm lawyers on Sambo. So I must stress that at this point, that it's very difficult to give specific and personalized advice to patients without a thorough knowledge of their past and current medical history, examination findings, and investigation results. Also, due to time constraints, I have summarized the questions in a way that I think retains the essence of what is being asked. Therefore, these answers should only be used as a guide and individualized care and medical management should be sought from one's own doctor. Okay, so our first question is um, a logistic question. Where do I get equipment to aid my recovery, like crutches, chair, and toilet risers, etc.? So you should get all of that from the hospital that treats you. Um, so, for example, in our hospital, which is Spire, Manchester and Didsbury, uh, when patients come in for a hip replacement, they normally see the physios before their admission. So they get shown how to use crutches. And then when they're an inpatient, so for that couple of days after the operation, before they're ready to go home, they'll be assessed by the physios. So they'll see whether they need a toilet seat. What the toilet seat does essentially, if you've got a little bit of upper body weakness, it's quite hard to get up uh, from, and a lot of toilets are very low. So having a raised chair at home or a toilet seat just makes that a lot easier. So they'll often, you'll get all that as part of the package, um, both NHS and private, and then you just take it home with you. So that should all be provided basically. Okay, brilliant. Okay, the second question, is my pain wasn't in my hip, but was in the groin, which is exactly what you've said. How can you tell when you need a hip replacement? Well, well, hip pain's a bit odd, actually. So the most common feature is groin pain, and particularly underpant mm. crease pain. But it can present with buttock pain. It can present radiating down the front of the leg to the knee. Sometimes it even presents with knee pain. For example, I recently saw a patient who had had a knee replacement for their knee pain in inverted commas, and it was their hip all along. Oh um, so it can be a bit weird. And that's one of the reasons why it's good to see a physio first, because they'll often help all that muscular pain. And then all of that will kind of go away and you're left with the hip pain. But a telltale sign is kind of pain around the top of the leg, increasing stiffness, particularly a loss of inward twist of the knee. That's often a good sign. Um, pain putting on, or difficulty putting on shoes and socks. So th those kind of factors. But I think in the end of the day, if you're getting that, you know, your GP is a good starting point. You know, get an X-ray, let them examine you, and then you can go from there, basically. Okay. So the next question is: I've seen that recovery can take anywhere between six and twelve weeks. Why is there such a time range? Um, I suspect it's due to the condition of the patient before. So the fitter yeah. and stronger you are before, the quicker your recovery. Um, surgery is a weird thing. You know, I can do four hip four or five hip replacements in a day. The eight-year-old granny can be up and about, flying around the ward. The, the young patient could be lying in bed as if the world ended, or vice versa. So how people respond to surgery is really individual, their pain tolerances and how robust they are. But, but as a general rule, um, it's, it's about how fit you are before. It's about the surgeon minimizing the disruption during the operation. So keeping the time of surgery down, keeping the incision small, the soft tissue management, you know, gentle, uh, and all of that kind of aids recovery. Okay. And how long would you expect to have to be off work after okay. the replacement? So very much depends on what you do. Uh, so I think I would say usually at least at least three to four weeks, even if you're self-employed and desk-based. Um, I think you're a bit frazzled for the first couple of weeks, so it's important not to make important decisions. Um, if you do have to do emails, I usually say, put them in your, if you're doing it at night when you're most tired, put them into the draft box and look at them again the next day. Um, realistically, you're not going to be driving for three or four weeks, even if it's even automatic and it's your other side. Um, you know, you're going to be tired, you need to rest, recover. Uh, and if you take a good kind of six to eight weeks off, you, you find that actually you return to full function quicker than if you try and go back too quickly. Um, so I would normally say kind of roughly six to eight weeks. Okay. 
Okay, great. Okay, the next question is, I wish I'd known, it's kind of a statement, I wish I'd known that it would make my leg and knee feel sore afterwards rather than the hip area, which was fine. Is that usual or is that unusual? Um, if what is common is that for the first three, four weeks, they often get swelling and bruising uh, at the top of the leg where the hip is. And then as they become vertical again, so they start to walk around, that tends to move down the leg just because of gravity, basically. So some people will get some kind of leg swelling and discomfort. Um, you do wiggle the leg around doing the operation. So sometimes that can irritate the knee temporarily, but it, it should settle down. The last thing I suppose that can happen is if your hip's really sore, it drowns out pain from anywhere else. So if you then cure the hip and their pain disappears, they can sometimes become conscious of a sore knee or a sore somewhere else. So the hip replacement itself doesn't directly affect anywhere else, but removing that source of pain can uncover other kind of areas. And obviously, if you've got arthritis because you were very sporty in one joint, it's not uncommon to have it in other joints as well. And to play devil's advocate, if maybe the position of the hip wasn't optimal, would that maybe affect the joints around it? Or is that uh... um, so certainly lengthening the leg um, beyond kind of, uh, well, you can debate the length, but certainly more than one to two centimetres. Um, patients will always feel that. Uh, that can cause issues with their back or spine. Um, not having the cup in a good position makes you more likely to dislocate. So that can cause issues with having to go back to hospital uh, or early failure of the component. Um, so that, that can also, certainly putting it in wrong can cause problems, which is why there's been this move towards newer technologies uh, to put it in more accurately. Okay. Okay, so the next question is, um, can you speak about the occurrence of faulty parts? My, dad, my dad's was faulty, and the ball dislocated from the socket in a second surgery. The background is he fell on the night of surgery post-op while going to the toilet. A nurse was present. She told him that all was fine with the hip. He was not straight when he was sent home. A couple of days later, we had to call an ambulance and he was taken to hospital with a dislocation. I know that they did not do the full replacement again, but he did have to go in with another operation through the original scar. And this person says they think that they replaced the faulty part, which was the ball, they think. So, so this is a prime example of having a bit of the history, and this isn't a criticism of the question at all. It's just yeah. that, you know, there's a limit to what you can say. Um, yeah. it's, it, usually the parts themselves aren't faulty. Uh, and this might be a case where actually everything was done correctly the first time. Certainly, that when if you remember, I talked about the risk of dislocation, which in men is about 1%. Um, you're most likely to dislocate in the first three months. One of the issues immediately after the surgery, particularly if you have a spinal, is you can get dizzy afterwards because the drugs affect your blood pressure. Uh, and so patients can become a bit woozy when they first start to get up and about that can cause them to fall, and then the fall can cause a dislocation. If it dislocates, it tends to rip the muscles that have been repaired at the end of the first operation. And so your risk of having another dislocation is about 50%. Um, so what might have happened in that situation is that they had to reopen things in order to put either put the hip back or repair the tissues that were torn at the time. Um, if you can get to the sick the three month stage, then usually everything's really healed up and it's really tight. And which is why we then allow people to be as active as they want from three months. But for that first three months, there is definitely that risk of dislocation. Um, now, obviously, we don't know this patient and we don't know the, the full story. Yeah. So it could have been put in in a funny position, which made him more likely to dislocate. But um, that's not something I see that often. And certainly it's not something you get with robotics, etc. And are falls, I mean, falls in hospitals are not uncommon and it's it's a big um, flag, isn't it? And, and, and thing that we, th something that we all, every hospital audits the rates of falls. Um, is it common after hip replacement 
So, so as you said, falls is a big issue. Um, although, thankfully, you know, I can't talk for other hospitals, but in our hospitals, it's, it's rare. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the biggest issue around spinal anesthetics is that when you, so normally when you stand up, your body reacts immediately and your blood mm -hmm. pressure goes up and your heart speeds up and your blood vessels contract. Uh, the spinal anesthetic slows that down, which is why people sometimes get dizzy. Uh, so, for example, in our place, before getting people up, they'll check their blood pressure and then they'll make sure there's someone right beside them when they stand up for the first time. Um, and that definitely helps. And then if there's like, for example, I did four hip replacements yesterday. And then when I went to see them all this morning, two of them were, were getting dizzy when they tried to stand up. So we just wait until it's all passed through their system and they're back to normal again. So, so I think there's a lot of precautions you can take to reduce the risk, but, um, you, you've, you know, it does happen basically. Yeah. So take great care in the mm. immediate post-operative yeah, period. Just, to just that sure first day. On your feet up. Yeah, yeah, that first day or two. And then usually by then the effects of the spinal have worn off and um, you've checked their blood. So you know, they're not anemic uh, and they should be okay then after that. Okay, perfect. Really valuable advice. Okay. So our next question, um, I'm fortunate enough to have had successful life-changing surgery, bilateral hip replacements. So my questions are about the future. I'd like to know the best things to do to look after them and whether it's realistic to think I could avoid needing them done again in my lifetime as I was quite young when they went in. What should I avoid doing or do more of? And you've kind of answered that already. Yeah, I suppose I just reiterate, um... The point of doing them is not just about pain relief, but it's about enabling you to have a, a fully lived life, basically. Um, I mean, there are simple things you can do. So keep your weight down, uh, keep healthy, um, you know, keep a good, strong core and hip muscles. So something like a regular Pilates or core focused yoga is really helpful. Um, some people will avoid heavy impact exercise. But that's complicated because actually there isn't much evidence around that. And what I mean by ex impact, I mean running, road running particularly. Um, even if you go for one run a week, it's a tiny proportion of the steps you would take in a whole week. And from the message, you get the feeling that this might be a, a woman writing it. And, and obviously you've got to worry about things like osteoporosis once they get to their mid to late 50s, 60s. So a little bit of impact exercise is really good for your bone health. So my advice, um, and this is from somebody who's had surgery myself, is, is just live your life and be as active as you can be um, and really get the most out of your hip replacements. You know, you're, you're, you're lucky to have had a good result. Um, so I think live your life the best you can, um, you know, keep the rest of you healthy. Um, and then if there is an issue in the future, we can deal with it then. And this person mentions that um, they have had bilateral hip replacements, and that means both hips, the left and right, have been replaced, and at a reasonably young age. Um, like you say, we don't have the information to say, is there some background to, to which clearly has predisposed them to requiring hip replacements? Should they be exercise extra caution, or is your advice the same, one side, both sides, doesn't matter, you have your life back, enjoy it? So about 10% of the ones we do are double hip replacements. Uh, and they would tend to be patients who are sore on both sides, but often one slightly worse than the other. Um, and even though it is a big operation, um, I think it's still easier than having to have them six or eight weeks apart, um, particularly if you're self-employed and you might have to, you know, stop working for long periods. But post-operatively, we just treat them exactly the same as a normal single hip replacement. So again, once you get to six weeks, you can stop all the formal precautions. And then once you get to three months, you can do whatever you want. But we do remind them that they'll improve up to about a year. So our last question from one of our listeners is that um, they say that I've just had a hip replacement in France. My orthopod comments that he can always tell when he's operating on a woman who is over 65 and still on long-term HRT because the connective tissues and bones are much healthier 
better defined and easier to operate on. Would the prof agree or like to elaborate? Um, so I'm not sure if it's the HRT itself or is it the fact that they're not osteoporotic? Um, certainly when you're doing the hip replacement, um, you can tell if someone's got weaker bone, um, either in the cup or in the femur. Uh, it's just softer and it's just not quite as hard. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why in older patients we used what's called a cemented hip replacement because it reduces your risks of things like breaking the bone. Um, I suppose the benefit of HRT potentially is that it will allow you to be active and your tissues to be healthier. But but I suspect what he's really talking about is osteoporosis, uh, which is obviously very common in, in patients really from kind of mid 50s onwards uh, and that's why i think it's it's often useful for 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 women when they get to that stage is to think about having a, a dexa scan say around the 60 age mark just to see where they're up to i mean it's amazing how many female runners i see who are quite slim often vegan particularly, so they'll have a low dairy input. Uh, and then when we do scan them, they've got really bad osteoporosis, which then needs yes. kind of formal and aggressive treatment. So so I suspect it's more the lack of osteoporosis because of the HRT rather than the HRT itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, they go on to ask, also, why do people still use, this is quite technical, why do people still use lateral or posterior approaches, so that's from the side of the back, for THR when anterior is muscle sparing, quicker and faster recovery? So essentially, there's a number of different ways to get into the hip. So when hip replacements first started, they used to take some of the bone off and then wire it back on again. But the recovery from that wasn't great. Uh, and sometimes that bone would fly off. Um, by far, the most common approach in the UK is what's called the posterior approach, which is going in the back. Uh, and that works really well. Essentially, you just move the big muscles out of the way and then you just cut a couple of little tiny tendons and then repair them at the end. Um, this question refers to a thing called the anterior approach, which is essentially going in the front through, uh, through or in between some muscles. Uh, very common in Europe, particularly France, um, much less common over here. There isn't a lot of evidence to show that there's any difference. Um, that, that approach has its own problems. There's a particular nerve that can get damaged uh, and you're probably more likely to put the implants in in an incorrect position because you can't see as well as you can through the back. So, and bearing in mind that my patients will go home usually after one or two days and then they're off their crutches by somewhere between one to four weeks. So I don't think there's a big difference in recovery period. Uh, and I do a lot of hip, you know, I do probably about six times the national average of hip replacement. So I do a lot and I see a lot of patients afterwards. Um, and for me, I'm, I'm not so much focused on um, a patient being recovered, you know, five days earlier or seven days earlier. I want to put a PIP in that will last 20, 30 years of a very active lifestyle. So I'm more interested in long-term outcomes and I want to be able to see where I'm putting it, be really confident about how solid it is. Uh, and so for the sake of a couple of days, I just don't think it's worth it, basically. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that completes our listeners' questions. I've got one final question from myself, and it is that you have operated on many, many patients requiring hip replacement surgery. Given the opportunity, is there anything that you'd like to say to patients who you think, who they think, sorry, may need or who may have had a hip replacement? So people always leave it too long because they're terrified of having an operation. So my, well, a few bits of advice is, um, you know, don't ignore it, get, get investigated because occasionally it's something else that needs urgent treatment. Um, if you can put up with it just with strengthening and the odd painkiller, then that's fine. Don't get anything done. But if it's starting to affect your life and your quality of life, then don't put it off because it's a, it's a really reliable operation, which is life changing. Um, not all surgeons are the same and their outcomes are not the same. So do your research. Um, if necessary, speak to different people. 
Um, as orthopaedic surgeons, we have lots of information about how good we are at our job. So we get a lot of outcome data uh, showing how long our implants survive as individuals. And as a patient, you should have the confidence to be able to ask about that uh, and question the surgeon that's looking after you. And if they're a bit shifty or they're uncomfortable giving you that information, then perhaps they're not the right person to do your operation. Because if they're funny with you before your surgery, they're going to be a lot more funny if you have a complication or if you have a problem afterwards. So you need to feel that, I mean, you're putting your your life or your hip in these people's hands and you need to be really comfortable about that. Okay. So, and to get that kind of information, it would require the patient to ask the surgeon or is there anywhere else that it can be accessed? So you, um, So a patient can access, there's a thing called NJR Profile. If you just Google that, and that will tell you uh, what kind of operations a surgeon does, say how many hip replacements they do and what the national average is, so that you can get that easily. There's a website called FIN, which is P-H-I-N, uh, and that's run by the government, but, but that will give you um, what's called outcome scores for surgeons, as in how well their patients are doing, as well as some feedback from patients. So you can search, that's all freely available. Uh, and then more detailed information, the consultant themselves will have it. So you could ask them about, well, how, how many do you do? What's your outcomes like? Uh, what's your revision rate like? So all of those kind of questions. And I think that's entirely reasonable to ask. And is it a requirement in your specialty to have this information? So every surgeon should have it? Every surgeon or, has it. Yeah, you, you have to enter that information uh, because the hospitals, it's mandatory for the hospitals. So everywhere and we're all centered now whether they read it or use it is another question but it's accessible to everybody okay. Well, okay so in closing max i'd like to thank you so much for coming on to the show and for sharing your highly specialized knowledge with us thank you so much for supporting my efforts to educate patients and above all thank you so much for helping so many people to regain an active life thank you it's an absolute pleasure. You take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Please keep your eyes and ears open for upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like and subscribe buttons to raise awareness of this podcast.